You did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. You did not invite me in. I needed clothes. You did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, But Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you were asked to describe him this morning, how would you do so? In this age of recycled comic book heroes parading across the big screen, uh, Superman and Batman and Iron Man and Spider-Man as a teenager, no less, would you thus put Jesus, the most powerful man who ever walked this earth, in a costume with a cape? Maybe some of those molded muscles special effects gadgets on his belt? Or would you perhaps depict him as as a far more peaceful fellow, a sort of leftover 60s guy wearing sandals, uh, sitting by a light shore somewhere, uh, playing with children, strumming a guitar, kumbaya me, (laughs) kumbaya me. Maybe you picture him like some of those artists of old, like Warner Salomon did, the ones who did the painting that you saw in your Sunday school room growing up. I'm sure you did it because it was in every Sunday school room growing up. There were 500 million of them around the world. Every U.S. soldier in World War II got a, got a wallet-sized version of it to carry with them. It became known as the American Jesus. So some thought that was Jesus, I guess. And just to make sure you knew it too, others painted a little halo over his head as if to say, yeah, this is the one. But that wasn't really him, was it? All too frequently, the picture which we saw did not in the least resemble that of someone who would have been a Semitic or Hebrew man of the ancient Middle East. The blonde hair, the blue eyes, the Western and sometimes even modern features, they seem to give that away. But the truth is, We have sometimes pictured Jesus to be in our image more than we have tried to picture ourselves in his image. Maybe we still do. I have a feeling we're not by ourselves. See, Jesus has never been all that easy. Those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they walked several miles with the resurrected Christ without even knowing who he was. And even Mary, as in our stained glass window here, um, she thought he was the gardener at first. But long ago in a story that the master told his followers, he he gave us a surefire way to spot him whenever we want to do so. He he told his listeners that if if they want to see him, they could do that by looking into the eyes of others 
particularly in the eyes of those who have deep needs in their lives. The master went so far as to tell us we could actually even serve him just by serving other people. And if that, if we wanted to do such, it's not even, we should note all that of extraordinary of response on our parts. The acts of which Jesus spoke, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, being kind to the stranger, giving clothes to those who have none, visiting those who are sick or in prison. All of these are fairly simple acts which don't require either great resources or unusual abilities or on our parts or special gifts. We just have to do them. See, we should notice what Jesus did not say in this little story. He did not say, as one has paraphrased it, I was hungry and you arranged for a panel discussion on the root causes of world hunger. He said, I was hungry and you fed me. He did not say, I was thirsty and you lectured me on the sinfulness of alcohol. He said, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. He did not say, I was in prison and you paid state and federal taxes in order to support the largest penal system and the free world in Texas. He said, I was in prison and you visited me. Jesus didn't ask us to farm out these duties either to FEMA or other governmental agencies or the Red Cross or any external group. He just told us to make certain that we ourselves respond whenever we may come across folks in life who have needs deeper than our own. The whole point of this passage here in Matthew 25 would seem to simply be that when we do that, that's when we see Jesus. The same Jesus, so it would appear, who takes it downright personally when we don't do good to other people. What he will look at, what he will look like, so this parable says to us, will be exactly like the faces of those people whom we decide to help. Alternately, the faces of those whom we decide to ignore. The gospel this morning suggests to us, in no uncertain terms, that it is how we deal with those folks that has something rather directly to do with how Jesus will one day deal with us. Which is why when John Wesley set out to tell his Methodist followers how to follow Christ more closely in their lives, he told them simply to do good. More specifically, Wesley's words were later expanded by his followers. He didn't exactly say it this way, but we've said it. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, and all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. And just in case somebody still wasn't sure exactly what he meant, Mr. Wesley spelled it out even further. He picked up this very same example Jesus spoke of here in Matthew 25. So in turn, when the early Methodists got together, they didn't just sit through a sermon and mutter their way through a hymn. Uh, they got out and they got dirty. They went to prisons, which were truly awful places in those times. 200 capital offenses in England during the time of the Wesleys, 200. They took care of the orphans and the widows, because nobody else did. They ministered to the coal miners at four in the morning. They housed the blind and those with no one else to care for them. Now they sang hymns all right, and those hymns reflected their same fervor and faith and caring for the poor, which the rest of their lives did. Uh, what does the national anthem of, of Methodism say? Uh, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood to make the foulest clean is blood availed from me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb. Your loosened tongues employ, ye blind. Behold your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. They understood the divine task which God had given them. That's not to just make people's lives better in this world, but to prepare them for the next as well. This morning as we consider what has largely been lost by many in our culture, those shared commitments to community and civility and this morning to compassion, I humbly suggest to you that that's the challenge that lies before those of us who are the modern heirs of John Wesley's movement as well. Uh, once again, what did the master tell us about how we ought to treat those around us? He said, I assure you, literally, amen in the Greek, amen, amen. Or as Matthew McConaughey might say, amen, amen. 
When you do good to those, to one of the least of these, my brothers, you are doing it to me. And sometimes folks have wondered, well, who did Jesus mean by that? Who, 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 who are the least? Some have said that the brothers he was referring to were specifically the disciples and the apostles, and they were pretty close to the bottom of the economic social ladder. What the master was saying was that people who will, who will be judged on the basis of how they have accepted or refused those who have been charged with spreading the gospel, uh, who may do so even in spite of being homeless or poor or imprisoned. Being a professional in that field, that's kind of an attractive interpretation to me personally. Jesus is talking about preachers here. But I don't think that's what he was doing. What he was saying was not in reference to pastors, but to the kind of folks whom sociologists would label today as simply the marginalized, those who live at the edges of our society, can even go largely unseen by the majority of everybody else. What Jesus was saying was that if you and I really want to follow him, then we better start seeing those people and start doing something about them. Not just because when the judgment comes, we don't want to be found on the wrong side of that whole sheep and goats divide thing, though we don't, but more so because simply doing good to others is the right thing to do, isn't it? It's one of the things that strikes me about this little story, this notation that those who did care for others seem surprised by what Jesus had to say to them. I think that's simply because uh, they never did what they did in order to be, to be given something else in turn. They just did it in order to be faithful. They did it because sheep who hung around the shepherd long enough eventually began to act like him, whereas goats never will. And it should be the same with you and me. Because it's pretty obvious, there's a lot of good which we need to be about doing in the coming days. We have neighbors who are still out of their homes. Some are out of their churches due to the damage of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we've worked the past two weeks here in Riverstone, but also in Rosenberg and Richmond and West Houston and Addicts. The bulletin on the back tells you some of the numbers that they've been updated. We've now helped, uh, uh, we've now had over 120 people volunteering. We've uh, worked in over 60 something homes. We've distributed over $90,000 worth of supplies and relief. But we're going back out this week to Wharton from Wednesday to Saturday. We're going to try to send an overnight group to Rockport later on this year. And like I said, we've given out thousands of dollars worth of supplies, uh, cleaning buckets, bedding buckets, kick the buckets, it doesn't matter. Our folks from Draw had them all. And Umcor and World Vision sent us health kits and cases of water and wheelbarrows and rates and enough diapers to have absorbed the Brazos River if we'd had them early enough. <laughs> but we still need to make certain that the East Fort Bend food pantry stays full that Family Promise offers a place to stay for folks who don't have one right now, that, that Pastor Winston up at the Life Center stays open to offer a bed to the homeless who show up at his door every day, that our friends in Haiti and Mexico and now Kenya don't feel abandoned by us. And before very long at all, we'll need folks who will help with our holiday gift drives for some of those who don't have the resources to provide for their children. We need folks who will go out and swing a hammer on the Habitat project when we, when we reschedule that early next year. For even if we can't solve all of the problems in the world this morning, we can at least solve a few of them for one or two people, can't we? I understand that about now, a lot of folks have begun to succumb to what some have labeled compassion fatigue. According to Dr. Charles Fidley, he's a professor at the Tulane Traumatology Institute, wouldn't you love to work there? Doesn't that sound fun? This stress disorder occurs when those helping others in distress neglect their own self-care and they begin to experience pain and suffering themselves. So they hit the wall when it comes to compassion, just because there are so many needs, there are so many needy people, there are so many appeals, there are so many emergency emails from Christchurch to our members. 
Come now to help us unload an 18-wheeler. No, don't come now. The truck is stuck at the border. Uh, no, no, come, come now. Wait, it's, it's, it's caught in, in Houston traffic. I get it. Some folks have even been unsubscribing from our church email list because our church blasts. We've been blasting them too much. But Paul says in Galatians 6, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. We do not give up. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. And so along with community and civility, we're called this morning to rescue this idea of compassion uh, from the lost and found bin in our culture. Because if you really want to see Jesus this morning, when you drive out of our parking lot, look a little closer at the people whom you meet today. The waiter at the restaurant, the clerk in the store, the woman in your office tomorrow who drives you nuts. The neighbor next door or down the street that sort of spills over in your personal space at time. The person sitting in the seat in front of you on the airplane who just decides to lean back all the way <laughs> in an egregious display of original sin. But look also at all those folks who are living in the shadows this morning the ones that are really easy to overlook if we're not careful. I saw one Friday morning at HEB, I'm sad to say that I blew it. When I came out of the store, she was sitting on the bench and she asked me if I had 75 cents. I didn't have any change on me at all, so I said, sorry, no, and I walked on. And it was the truth. But before I could even get to my car, I knew I'd just glimpsed the face of Christ and turned away. So I scrounged around in my car, I found a few dollars, I went back to talk with the woman, but somehow in those moments of rusting with myself, she slipped away. I missed not just helping her, I missed her helping me to see Jesus and to serve him. But I'm not alone, am I? For all of our generosity, for all of our generosity, Americans only rank number two in the world when it comes to giving behind Myanmar, Burma. Some studies put us number five behind even Kenya. Six of seven Americans, in fact, don't even give 2% of their income to other people. It's what's been called the paradox of, of generosity. But on the other hand, I think of how among the money that has come into our church to help others to recover from the hurricane, there were two gifts from dear ones we know in Florida. Almost as soon as Harvey hit, they went online and they sent money to help people here. Within a week, Debbie and Steve, one of the couples, lost their home in Jacksonville due to the flooding from Irma. The other couple, Skip and Linda, had their basement flooded in Orlando and lost power for 10 days. Those two families understood, however, that as hard-headed as any of us may be, there is probably somebody else who as yet needs our help and compassion even more. So they responded. Accordingly, compassion fatigue is everywhere. Don't overlook who the least really are. In the land of Judah, Bethlehem was the least. Elakistos is the Greek word. They were the least when it came to size and prominence among all the clans of Judah, but not so in the plan and providence of God. St. Paul said he was the Alekistos, he was the least of all the apostles. But look at how God used him. James, the brother of Jesus, said even large ships are steered by a very small Alekisto rudder. In the Alekistos around us, we will see Jesus. 
And when we rediscover compassion, we'll find as well the countenance of God. Once you have it, don't be surprised when the king says to you one day, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Dear friends, on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for all of us,